uh, probably realize that uh, if you have a moderately normal upbringing, um, as much as can be expected under those circumstances, a normal person would look back and say, this is pretty strange. This was pretty strange. We had secret servicemen as kids. Um, I went to Kefauver Elementary School uh, here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and there was a, um, a big, tall secret serviceman who sat outside of our classroom and followed me everywhere I went. And and the poor Secret Service would have to either run along behind the horses uh, or drive the horses. Uh, a little strange, I'll say. Not a, a unique experience. Yeah, I'd say. Yes. But, uh, well, in, in thinking about how ubiquitous your grandfather's presence was, um, obviously he's one of these figures in history who, as President of the United States, also had this other part of his life that was uh, just as important, even more important in some ways, in shaping yeah. the world we live in. Uh, 80 years ago, um, our World War II weekend event is telling the story of America at war in 1942, uh, like his leading Operation Torch, it's his uh, big break. And I, I wanna focus more a little bit on, on this photograph that we have behind us here, uh, strategically placed, I should know. Um, he goes from, a, from your book, I believe, you wrote 107 officers under his command in 1942. Two years later, on the eve of D-Day, over three million under his command. Uh, that's, an, that's a conservative estimate. Yeah. And so let's, let's talk a little bit about that, about that D-Day experience uh, of leadership uh, for, for Dwight Eisenhower. Um, in, in your memory of this, and in, in your uh, thinking about this, what are some of those key moments from, from the D-Day leadership experience from Ike's part, uh, point of view? Well, I think there, there are two things here. First of all, think about the organizational challenge of scaling up <laughs> in that short a period of time. Uh, we talk about scaling up all the time, and. In, in the business world or in any organizational environment. Uh, but the idea of bringing um, the manpower and the, um, uh, the, the sheer firepower into play um, in that period of time is just extraordinary. Um, I think, though, there's, a, there's another way of looking at this, too. It's where I, uh, Dwight Eisenhower was um, in 1941. He was uh, a lieutenant colonel who was then uh, promoted to colonel. Um, and because of his uh, winning strategy at the Louisiana maneuvers, he gets his first star. Um, and this is in 1941. By 1945, he's got five permanent stars on his shoulders. So you might say that's an emotional scale up uh, of enormous um, proportions. Now, you talked about uh, Torch, which was uh, the first big invasion uh, that he, for which he had responsibility. Um, and uh, then came uh, Husky, uh, which was the, uh, Torch was uh, North Africa, Husky was Sicily. Um, and it goes on, every one of these operations got bigger and bigger. Uh, and as part of the scaling up of these operations is also the emotional scaling up of Dwight Eisenhower. And not only his, um, a growing sense of uh, leadership, but a lot of this uh, also requires a growing uh, sense of your own confidence in your judgment. So you get to D-Day, which is the largest military, uh, I'm sorry, the largest integrated military operation in history. Uh, and I'm sure it always will be, just because the numbers are so absolutely astounding. We put 156,000 people on those beaches on one day. Uh, with uh, 12,000 aircraft, uh, 300 warships, and thousands of other uh, support ships uh, crossing the English Channel. Uh, and, but by this time, he really began to uh, utilize all the lessons he'd learned from earlier, um, earlier operations. They all were ultimately successful, um, but there, he learned plenty of things he wasn't going to do or uh, situations he would not put himself in the second time. So if you'll indulge me for one minute. <clears throat> he gets everybody, uh, I mean, uh, George Marshall, the chief of staff of the Army, probably secretly really wanted to command uh, Operation Overlord. And why wouldn't he? I mean, it is the operation that has gone down in history. Uh, as we know, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt kept Marshall in Washington and assigned Dwight Eisenhower, who'd already as I say, commanded successfully earlier uh, operations. Um, but Ike looks at, uh, General Eisenhower looks at the plan and says, no way, 
I'm not going to implement a plan with only three beaches. So unless we double the size of the force and turn the Normandy beaches from three beaches into five beaches, uh, maybe you better find somebody else to do this. And this actually, um, what, they went round and round on this um, because actually, in order to increase the size of the uh, force, it required a little politicking about where the landing craft were being utilized for the overall war. Uh, and this took a lot of bargaining in Washington about um, the landing craft that were headed for the Far East and not for uh, Europe. In any case, in a short period of time, he doesn't get that command until Christmas of 43. And we launched D-Day on June 6, 44. Can you imagine all of that? They had to completely um, resurvey uh, the landing beaches, um, subterranean, I should say, uh, secretly at night, uh, and do, go through it all over again just to double the size of that force. So by the time D-Day came around, he didn't have, I mean, it was Eisenhower's plan. It wasn't anybody else's plan. So will you indulge me a bit more? Please. Two big decisions of that, that evening that um, actually made my hair curl. And, um, and I, I say that because I realized later I grew up with so many of the people who were there that night with him. They retired with him to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, his driver was with him on D-Day. His houseman, Sergeant Money, was with him on D-Day. And all of these people, they were all, oh, and the, the, the man who managed the farm that you're gonna see tomorrow was the rapporteur when the decision to go ahead on D-Day was taken. So these people were so bonded. And it was something that the females in the family just couldn't fully understand. They could all finish each other's sentences. This is later in life. But now I know why. Because uh, two, uh, three things, actually. Uh, about uh, less than a month before D-Day, the British, I should say Winston Churchill, still was not convinced that the cross-channel invasion was a good idea. So can you imagine having your boss feeling queasy about one of the biggest decisions of the war? Um, that took a lot of courage, I think. Then about a week or so before the invasion itself, um, Eisenhower's uh, airborne commander comes to him and says, General, I don't think you should use the airborne troops. Uh, if you do, we're expecting 50 to 70% of them to perish uh, because the Germans have just moved a division into the area. Um, and, um, and this is my recommendation. So Eisenhower says to um, his airborne <coughs> Commander uh, Air Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory. Uh, he said, please write your recommendation down in writing because if I decide against you, I do not want you held responsible for advice I didn't take. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> that's pretty nice. Um, and then Ike goes off for two hours in a trailer all by himself and he runs through the strategy. What, um, what these five beaches mean, what the objectives are of the British, which was Caen, or the Americans, which was, um, uh, I'm sorry, we know it, on the coast there, I'll think of it in a minute. Um, and, um, and so uh, he thinks to himself, well, we'll never, we'll never meet our objectives if the airborne troops aren't dropped. And um, so he went back and said, Trafford Lee Mallory, we're going. Uh, we're gonna use the paratroopers despite this pessimistic uh, outlook, but we have to have them because they're the ones who are going to clear the way for people to get off the beaches. Um, uh, Cherbourg, that was the American objective. Uh, up the, uh, Carenton, uh, the Cotentin Peninsula, which is all the way at the top, so they had, they had to make a pivot up, and those paratroopers were going to clear the causeways, get the Germans out of the way so we could get people off of Utah Beach. And then the weather forecast. So in light of this, he thinks that the linchpin of the operation might perish because the weather forecast isn't appropriate. Um, not appropriate, just downright scary because nobody on the weather team agreed with the forecast. This has been glossed over by history. Um, there were many people on that committee who thought that no, the, um, the day was not gonna clear on June 6th. 
So this man took one of the biggest gambles probably in history because you can't drop paratroopers if they can't see their targets. That's one of the reasons they misdropped. So could I just finish? This is this picture. After after all of that, that he writes question. he writes a note. He writes a note to himself that says if this uh, uh, that everyone who participated uh, in the invasion did so um, uh, with full devotion to duty. Uh, they've been well trained. If there are any fault attaches to the failure, it's mine and mine alone. He puts it in his wallet. And then he goes and he visits the airborne troops up and down the Normandy coast there. Um, you know, they were dropping in Omaha Beach, behind, behind Omaha Beach, behind Utah Beach, and the British were dropping in their sectors, but weren't in the same level of danger. <coughs> He's looking, he is there looking at these men, thinking if my technical expert is correct, 50% of you are not coming back tomorrow or 70% was the other estimate. That was including gliders. So he's looking at them, and what do you think he's saying? This, is the, this was in my research. This was the most fun of all. He's saying to him, where are you from, son? Number 23, this paratrooper, told us, my family, this story personally. He survived the war. He's saying, where are you from, son? And he says, I'm from Michigan. And he says, oh, I go to Michigan all the time. I like to fly fishing. I like the fly fishing. And he says, I do, do too, sir. And he says, and he's asking the others. And Wally Strobel, number 23, says that as his plane took off to its unknown fate in Normandy, Dwight Eisenhower was still on the runway watching that plane go off. He stayed until every plane had left. That, is, that was the, um, the journey, his leadership journey. Uh, journey, I think, culminated in this moment. Weren't we lucky it worked out well? <laughs> well it's it's uh, arguably the most famous American photograph yeah. of the Second World War, uh, with like front and center. It's it's a model of empathetic leadership, I think. Yes, um, you know, and also let's remember that uh, my grandparents lost their um, their first son to scarlet fever at the age of three, and throughout the war, my grandfather was writing my grandmother every September 24th saying uh, that was the little boy's birthday. You know, we could be grandparents by now. Um, and what they, they missed from not raising him to be a son this age, because uh, their son would have been about this age at this time. So, you know, you have the double emotional thing. Well, in mentioning your grandmother, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of Ike's important relationships. Yeah. Um, and none was more important than Mamie. Uh, so much emphasis is on General Eisenhower, mm -hmm. but even with Ike as a five-star general, Mamie was a military spouse. Can you share a little bit about her story? She was a kick. <laughs> she, was, she was an absolute kick. She, she was not only um, funny pretty much at all times, but she thought if you weren't uh, having fun that there was something wrong with the picture. Uh, her father retired at the age of 32, uh, I mean, he was uh, from you know day to day work. He was still managing um, um, uh, a cattle business, and um, he retired to spoil his four daughters, um, which he was also successful at. And um, so it took Mamie uh, a while to get with the army program. It really did. I wrote a book called Mrs. Ike, um, and it's about her. It's actually about them. Um, but you know, she did something so important for him. Um, she taught him how to uh, gain perspective on his work by relaxing. Um, and she said, if you're going to work, you're going to work at the office. And when you come home, you belong to me. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's a, that's a good one. I wonder how you get, <laughs> how you implement that uh, these days. But uh, she, she was um, uh, a great source of um, relaxation and fun for him. And then, by the end of it, she had her own leadership trajectory, too. As an army wife, she became the kind of commanding general of the wives who'd been left behind in Washington, many of whom were in rolling states of panic because they didn't know what the fates were of their loved ones. And Mamie had to give them strength. So it required a lot from her at the same time. Another relationship you mentioned him earlier, 
Sergeant John Melney. Um, John and Dolores Melney are near and dear to our hearts at the Eisenhower site. Um, tell us a little bit about that wartime relationship that blossomed into a, a decades-long relationship. Well, I get, I, I get a little choked up when I think of Sergeant uh, Moni and Dolores Moni myself, but Sergeant Moni um, was an um, African-American gardener. Um, and I only mentioned African-American because uh, you, you do know that during World War II, by, uh, as part of the law of the land, uh, the Army was segregated. Um, and uh, African-Americans did play um, certain roles, and increasingly, actually, um, Dwight Eisenhower made uh, exceptions to that law, including uh, during the Battle of the Bulge, where African-American troops played a very big role. Um, but going back to Sergeant Money, he was just a gardener, and uh, Eisenhower decided that he uh, needed another houseman or ballet. Uh, and so he interviewed a range of people, and he decided to give Sergeant Money a chance to get out of the garden and come in and um, you know, play a role at headquarters. Um, and so um, for years, Sergeant Money was with him all the time. There was another valet, by the way, named uh, Mickey McKeo. If you want a really good read, it's Mickey McKeo's book called uh, General Ike and Sergeant Mickey. It's a riot. Um, but anyway, this uh, household staff, again, this is a tightly bonded group, uh, and as the war came to an end, uh, all of the other household staff peeled off, but Sergeant Money and Dwight Eisenhower uh, had a close relationship. Um, when Eisenhower ran for president, he had to give up his military commission, because we don't have military men running for president. Uh, he risked his pension, he risked um, you know, his five stars on running for president. That's a, another story of how that decision is made in my book. But, um, so Sergeant Money says to him, well, well boss, he says, uh, oh, I'm sorry, my grandfather said to Sergeant Money, you know, um, Money, maybe you should go find yourself a real job now because I might lose this election and then I don't know what I'm going to do, but you wouldn't, I mean, maybe you won't know what to do either. He says, boss, I think we're employable. <laughs> so he says, I'm staying with you. That's a great line. It's great. And, and uh, not only did he stay with him, but he stayed with him the rest of his life. And, um, you know, the, again, the women in the household, I was one of them, were just amazed at these two. Um, and uh, the, um, they used to say that Sergeant Money desegregated the South because as president, not only did Eisenhower introduce the first legislation, um, civil rights legislation um, and get it passed um, since Reconstruction. But if you were inviting President Eisenhower anywhere in the United States of America and Sergeant Money couldn't go and stay in the same hotel in the room next door or the room down the hall, then President Eisenhower wasn't coming. And it was just like that. I will say that it was uh, sad, um, it was gratifying that Granddad in his um, last um, years, um, made it clear that Sergeant Money was going to be a pallbearer at his funeral. So Sergeant Mar Money was the first pallbearer, African-American pallbearer in America, um, at the president's funeral. But even more interesting, Sergeant Money was a pallbearer shoulder to shoulder with four and five star generals. Mm -hmm. There was only one five star, that was uh, Omar Bradley. Um, and uh, by that time, uh, General MacArthur you know, was not in the picture, but the, the, the point being is that uh, Granddad didn't care about Sergeant Money's rank, and he didn't care about the, the racial piece of it. They were like that. Well, he was a man of many key important relationships, and uh, another relationship I think we should discuss, you mentioned it when we talked recently, uh, was his relationship with King George VI, yeah. whose daughter, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, just passed recently. Uh, and Ike and Her Majesty the Queen had their own close bond, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And I, I have to say I was really very moved um, and saddened by the Queen's death. Though she lived such a long, uh, distinguished lifetime. Think of what she did, uh, what, what her task was, not just to keep the monarchy alive and to keep um, you know, um, Britain and the UK uh, together to provide that uh, connective tissue, but she was really had the the terrible task of presiding over um, the last days of the British Empire. And she did so with such dignity and grace. I'm sure it made the Commonwealth 
possible in a way that it couldn't have been for, for anyone else. Now think about this. Um, Eisenhower is, is in London for a big part um, of this uh, of the European the war in the European theater, and he's in London. He he saw um, George VI quite frequently for lunch and other occasions. Um, but I know because we've seen pictures of it that Eisenhower knew the young princess. Uh, she was already uh, moving into her maturity, but when she came to the White House, I remember in 1957, um, they, they had a special bond, and my grandmother was terrified that um, uh, the, the girls, um, so I had two sisters, my brother David, my sister Anne, my younger sister <coughs> Mary, and we, uh, my, my grandmother gave us curtsying lessons, <laughs> absolutely terrified that we'd let the side down. You know, I've, I've been very nervous about curtsying ever since for whatever, for whatever reason, you have to do it occasionally, uh, just in case I put the wrong foot back in the wrong way. But uh, um, I had the great honor to um, meet the Queen again in 2007. Wow, and she told me what it meant to her that Dwight and Eisenhower and Mamie Eisenhower allowed her to sleep in the family quarters at the White House. That's the only time it happened in her entire reign. And, um, and then she, um, and, and we had a little discussion about that, um, which was really very moving for me. Uh, you might be interested to know that after Queen Elizabeth stayed in that guest room at the White House, my grandmother decided um, that that was the level at which that room was going to be used. And it was known ever after as the Queen's bedroom. It still is today. Now, when Winston Churchill came, in 1959, I believe it was, or 60, uh, he cheated a little because he was put in the Lincoln bedroom and apparently the mattress was very, very hard. <laughs> um, and in the middle of the night, he is alleged to have crawled out of the Lincoln bedroom and uh, tucked himself up in the Queen's bed in the Queen's bedroom. <laughs> it sounds like Churchill. It sounds like Churchill. Yeah, it sounds like Churchill. Well, um, it's, that, that's a wonderful story to share. Um, Ike was certainly a man of so many consequential relationships, and I thought those were just a few key ones to touch on. I have to add one way. thing Please here. Please do. Yeah. So I found uh, for my letter, and now you can see it on the internet. So Google it. It's, it's hysterical. But I found this letter when I went to the archives, and I put it into my book, Mrs. Ike. And it is a handwritten letter from the Queen of England to the President of the United States about her recipe for drought scones. And she said that, um, that she had seen a picture of him barbecuing quail, which obviously reminded her of the barbecue they'd had, um, because he visited her a number of times in the 1950s in London, and she said she realized she'd forgotten to send him the recipe. And the recipe goes into all kinds of detail. Um, and then she says, with tongue in cheek and a few exclamation points, she says, watching your round the world trip, uh, we shall never complain about what our subjects ask us to do again. Um, so warm uh, like that. Now, I just want to add to this, it's significant that she sent the recipe for drop scones to the president and not to the first lady, because my grandmother was not the cook. <laughs> my grandmother had it all figured out. <laughs> no, she, she, of course, she did cook in the course of their marriage, but he was the one who actively loved cooking. And so can you imagine the Queen of England and the President of the United States swapping recipes? There's <laughs> <laughs> something very sweet about that. Well, I'll, I'll say for everyone, uh, we have several items in the Eisenhower home given by Her Majesty the Queen, so you all better come out and see yeah. the house. <laughs> all better come uh, tour the Eisenhower home at uh, the Eisenhower site. Um, I want to pivot a little bit to uh, Eisenhower and some of the leadership philosophies and principles that you write about in your book here. And on a number of the tours you've given of the site and tours of the house, and you write about it in here, you talk about Eisenhower recommending a psychology department at uh, West Point, and how that is one of your favorite things that you came across in writing this book about President Eisenhower. Can you maybe share a little bit about that and why that's so important from a leadership perspective? Well, it's interesting because um, West Point uh, really is, but it always was even more than it is today, an engineering school. Um, and so after the war is over, um, Chief of Staff of the Army, Dwight Eisenhower, 
writes the superintendent of West Point, uh, General Maxwell Taylor, and writes a lovely note about um, my recommendation to you would be to establish a psychology department at West Point because he, he said uh, it would be important for the Army to learn how to um, solve human problems in human ways. Uh, and then he goes into a little detail. What, what amused me about this is when the chief of staff of the Army writes you out. Um, and I don't think he ever really had psychology courses specifically himself, but his mother um, presented many things he learned as a child in kind of an empathetic, um, um, look at it from the other guy's point of view, what do you think is going on in the other person's head type thing. His father was the disciplinarian, so I think Dwight Eisenhower really benefited from having both a lot of internal discipline, uh, that's what restraint requires, is personal discipline, with these features his mother had, which was uh, uh, gracefulness and, and empathy. Now sometimes empathy is called strategic empathy, which means that we're not taking the other guy's side at all, and it's requiring a really careful analysis of what the other guy's preconceived ideas are about you, and that's how we actually fooled the Germans in Normandy, because we convinced them we were coming into Calais. Uh, and that took a lot of psychology to figure out what were the Germans' preconceived ideas of how we thought about ourselves. This gets to be quite complicated and actually a very exciting area of study. Um, but also, he's dealing with a lot of uh, entanglements with this alliance. Uh, for instance, uh, you're celebrating a torch tomorrow. Uh, the British and the Americans simply couldn't settle down on when this cross-channel invasion was going to take place. And so some of these other uh, invasions before Normandy uh, are a compromise between the United States and Britain. And, um, and there were you know, lots of very strong feelings. And remember that um, some of the British outranked General Eisenhower, even during Torch. So he is watching a kind of um, adjustment that's having to take place because this is the first time we have integrated a multinational fighting force. And I'm sure what he did is he was calm enough and quiet enough and, and then when he wasn't quiet enough, he had a great way of knowing when to deploy his ego and when to suppress it. And I think that's really part of his genius. But I think he saw how emotional this was, you know, to have your own nationality having to depend on others for their liberation and all of the complicated factors. I think all of us will acknowledge that love is probably the strongest feeling, but let's never count out the impact of humiliation. <coughs> it's, it's an emotion that may be, in some ways, in certain circumstances, even more powerful. Is there a moment in his life that, um, you know, here at Gettysburg and Camp Colt, for example, that's such a key formative moment. Um, is there a moment, it could be Camp Colt or another moment like that, that you think is uh, really key or underrated, perhaps is the better word, in making him into the leader that he became? Well, I think that's a great question. And I, 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 I would say Camp Colt was really very formative. I don't know how many of you are familiar <coughs> with Camp Colt, um, but it's a, it's a, a great, um, and fascinating period here at Gettysburg. The, the history in this small town is so rich and so <coughs> extensive. You may not know that there was a German prisoner of war camp in this town too. Uh, in any case, Camp Colt uh, dates to World War I. Uh, Eisenhower wanted to go to the front uh, during World War I so badly. He wrote so many letters to his superiors that he was told if he didn't stop writing those letters, uh, he would be reprimanded for um, questioning um, the wisdom of his superiors. Uh, in any case, he, he finally gets um, the opportunity to um, connect with the 65th Engineers and his job, he was an early <coughs> tank proponent, and he is given the responsibility to command Camp Colt. Now, think about this. Um, Eisenhower is 27 going into 28 years old. He starts out with uh, a couple of hundred um, uh, early arrivals, and by the time um, things are in full force, he's got 600 officers and 10,000 men under his command, age 27, 28. 
Um, they don't have any trucks to train with, so he has to teach them how to fire from moving vehicles. Those are otherwise known as trucks. Um, and then uh, in uh, the fall of uh, 1918, a few officers come into the camp, a few soldiers come into the camp um, with uh, Spanish flu. And in a week, 157 men died of Spanish flu influenza. And the military wasn't really acknowledging that this was a problem because they didn't want to scare away recruits or they didn't know what best practices were. So Eisenhower convened a team and, and they managed to figure out how to isolate people, what to do that we all now have been schooled to do because of COVID. And I think one of the reasons he's remembered so by such a multi-generation of people here in Gettysburg is in 1918, he had to go talk to the townspeople about um, allowing their basements and hospitals to be used as makeshift um, quarantining areas, or uh, they didn't even have any place to put the bodies. They had to put those in the tent. I mean, it was um, one of the great improvisational um, uh, moments certainly of his early career. Uh, what moved me as I, um, and I know that we've got some camp cult experts in this audience, so I don't care for you. Um, but uh, what really moved me was at the uh, age of 28, he gets a promotion for his work at Camp Colt, but not long after that, he received the Distinguished Service Medal, which is remarkable at the age of 28. And then a number of years later, he um, graduated number one of his uh, class at Command and General Staff School. So he was somebody they were keeping an eye on, even though he was a bit of trouble from time to time. And all those, all those skills he used there were the skills that he used throughout his entire life, the skills that he used on his rise to becoming a five-star general, becoming president of the United States. And it's, it's such an interesting, fascinating part of the story because he's building these skills here at Gettysburg in 1918, and guess where his personal home is when he's president? Right well, here. I know, and I don't think they're disconnected. Absolutely. They're not disconnected, but you know, uh, one, one of the fun things of writing this book, first of all, I allowed myself to um, disassemble one of my silos which is that I allowed myself to take what I knew about him personally and apply it to what I was reading. So sometimes uh, I read some scholarship where they'd say, well, I don't understand why Eisenhower did that. And I was like, I do. <laughs> and the reason I do is I got that lecture at a dining room table at <laughs> 1964 when we were all gathered for so-and-so's birthday. No, well, anyway, um, I, but what I discovered, which was really interesting, is that two things, first of all, Scholars, by and large, either are really interested in his wartime experience or they're really interested in his presidency. But there aren't that many scholars who've had the energy to put it together. So I got around that by not writing a scholarly book, but by writing a leadership book. And then I could, I hope, demonstrate um, that Dwight Eisenhower, the general, and Dwight Eisenhower, the president, was the same person. And he used a lot of his military strategy and a lot of the means and methods that he used during the war in his presidency, including for all of the strife uh, that the Allies had in trying to get themselves organized and agreeing on strategy, I think in the end he found that pushback fantastically helpful. Because what does he do in his White House years? He's the first president to establish the Chief of Staff's office. And who does he put there? But a guy who is awfully like General um, Beetle Smith is Chief of Staff during the war. Same kind of personality, right? And then he, he, he peoples his presidential cabinet um, with individuals who are going to give him pushback all the time. The difference between, um, you know, a letting a, la a thousand flowers bloom is that when Dwight Eisenhower made a decision, you were following it. And he had a whole operational apparatus that was designed specifically to make sure that every cabinet member agreed to what he agreed to and it would be followed up and implemented uh, on a timetable. So that wartime experience had enormous impact. Well, I think uh, at this point, what we wanna do, um, we have a couple microphones. Um, we will do a, a book signing in just a little bit, uh, but we wanna give uh, some of you a chance to, to ask some questions. We have uh, about 15, 20 minutes left in our program here. Um, so uh, if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. We have uh, Jana and Josh here with microphones. We can uh, 
Can I assure you that all questions are, are okay? Because I've been asked everything. <laughs> I have one right here. Uh, hi, so I'm uh, Jason Pierce, and I actually worked at the Eisenhower Historic Site as an interpreter intern. And I put together a program on Eisenhower's um, convoy across the United States. So did he ever tell stories about that? Because I've heard a few, and they're, they're really good. But I want to know if there's, there's more. Well, you know, it's, um, uh, thank you for that great question. The, the, um, uh, the Army convoy in 1919 goes across the United States. It starts at the Ellipse, right? And it goes to San Francisco. How long did it take? About two months? Uh, I believe he characterized it as 62 days and 600 accidents. Oh, okay. <laughs> always, always uh, better at articulating than anybody. <laughs> yeah, well, that's um, uh, a pretty striking uh, comment. And of course, he carried that uh, with him um, certainly well into the presidency, but guess what else he carried with him, too, with the building of the interstate highway system. <laughs> During World War II, they were fighting for the Audubon. This was the way they could move uh, tanks through Europe um, with such extraordinary ease that this becomes a very, very important moment in the capturing of critical parts of that uh, for the campaign. Um, so he was a great believer of that. Now, the interesting thing about Granda um, is that he was a great writer. So if you want to hear his voice, of course I'm going to recommend mine because it's got a little editorial comments on the side, but he had an extraordinary voice and he was a great writer. He really was. He was our family's best writer. Uh, his book, At Ease, Stories I Tell to Friends, is just, it's a romp. And it's lovely and it's vivid and uh, I have to admire that. So uh, there's a wonderful account of that convoy there. Um, and um, I think... You know, that is one way to, to read him and understand that. I would just close by saying, though, to us, he didn't talk about the war particularly, um, and he didn't talk about the convoy particularly. In his later years, I got a certain amount of when I was your age type stuff. Um, but it was, I don't think it was in terms of conveying stories about the convoy. He was always thinking about the future, even in his later years, and he took his Gettysburg farm and wanted to make it productive. He wanted to um, revitalize the land, uh, which had been worn out, and he wanted to enter the cattle business, and it was all about the future, making something better than the way he found it. Have one right here. Hi, Susan. Thanks so much for coming to speak with us. I know we talked a bit about ICE relationships with heads of state, um, but I was wondering if you'd be able to um, speak more with other um, other soldiers from other countries, namely Montgomery, and what his relationship was. I know it got off to a bit of a rocky start, but I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit. A visitor at the Gettysburg Park. Oh, that's right. You know, I um, thank you very much for that question. I, I'd like to answer it in, in two ways, if I'm, I might. First of all, his relationship with the GIs was really quite extraordinary. Um, at any possible moment he had pre or he even scheduled it in, he went to visit as many of the troops who were going to participate in uh, active combat and, and the rest of it during the war. And I can't tell you how many veterans have come up over the years and told me stories. Um, there was a wonderful British uh, officer who told me about, uh, uh, they, the, the British were trying to impress the Supreme Commander, um, and they let a carrier pigeon loose to fly to London to demonstrate the, the great utility of um, carrier pigeons. And the pigeon flew around the general's head twice and sat on a tree branch and cooed. <laughs> and apparently, you know how the British would say they were mortified. Um, they were so embarrassed, and Ike says, well, let's keep working on our communication. <laughs> and another time he was up talking to the GIs and he went down, it had been raining, and he slipped on a step and fell in the mud. Um, and everybody started laughing and he got up, gave him a gigantic smile and a, you know, a, um, a, a big wave and then they went crazy. The GIs thought it was great that he wasn't upset or humiliated, but he thought it was rather funny himself. So he had this great rapport with them. Now when it got to the generals, 
it was obviously more complicated. Uh, Montgomery outranked Eisenhower. Um, I think the um, I think it would be fair to say, and I'm certainly sympathetic to it, that it was very hard for the British who had already been in this war before we arrived, you know, to begin to relinquish the command of, of key moments in that war. But if Ike's personality and Montgomery's personality is anything to go by, I can tell you that Monty visited uh, Dwight Eisenhower after the war quite a number of times. He was a house guest at the farm. I think it's in 1954, he goes with the Eisenhowers to Augusta, Georgia for Thanksgiving. That's pretty amazing. And my grandmother thought he was adorable. <laughs> I told her she was a kid. She, she says, well, he was my favorite house guest. And, um, you know, I tried to press her on that. And she says, well, he's just, he's just adorable. He's charming. Um, so I later found in a newspaper, or no, uh, I guess it was in her oral history. He came to uh, the White House, uh, Monty, General Montgomery, and looked around the White House and said, well, it's not Buckingham Palace. <laughs> <laughs> and my grandmother, who had these incredibly large, beautiful, like China blue eyes, gave him a bat and says, well, thank goodness for that. <laughs> but the two of them were very good at this repartee, and Mamie loved who she loved. And she loved Jean MacArthur. She loved uh, all of the, uh, she loved Bess Truman. And it didn't matter whether her husband was arguing with their husbands. She liked who she liked. So anyway, I don't know if that, that helps. But you know, the, um, the British have a very different way of looking at strategy than Americans do. They, they've never met a full confrontation that they think is effective. Um, and some of that is cultural. Some of it has to do with experience from other wars. And Americans love direct assaults. Um, uh, and we were in favor of a cross-channel uh, invasion in 1942. The British put the brakes on as long as they could. Um, and these, um, these kinds of disagreements over strategy continued throughout the war. But I, I, I just want to say one time again is that the bonds between these people, even if they didn't agree with each other, were so strong because of this shared experience. And I have to say in my own life, um, you know, it's not easy being related to somebody who was as consequential as this man was. And I say this, you know, as the, um, I'm not wearing the boss of stars perspective. I mean, just look at the role he played during World War II and then a successful two-term presidency that is today ranked as number five. Um, with three balanced uh, budgets and came close in another two of those years. Not one combat death, not one American combat death in our military after the end of the Korean War, which he ended. I mean, it's an extraordinary, the first civil rights legislation, it goes on and on. Um, and it's a little hard uh, to be related to, to that. But at the end of the day, I found my own bonds too. And I used to think that Normandy was only his story, but wait, I, I grew up with all the guys from Normandy. I knew them, they knew me. They took me under their wings, some of them. And then, today, um, it's just actually so much fun that I know most of the grandchildren of, of these individuals, and one of them who were remain nameless, <laughs> a very famous general um, whose father just died, whispered, in my ear in Normandy, is this what I'm going to be doing from now on? And I said, yes, join the club. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you never you never know about these things, but um, you know it's it's wonderful to feel that sense of full history, which of course is what you're going to feel tomorrow and over this weekend. That's what brought us all here tonight. Yeah. Other other questions? Yep. Oh, got a couple in the front here. Go ahead. Oh, I guess yeah. we'll wait for the mic, yeah. Right here, you. So what was like the process Joe Eisenhower went through for the whole process of playing for D-Day? Oh, well, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I would say, first of all, it's important to remember that it, at, at uh, this stage of his career, he is a strategic leader which means that he is the person who has to reconcile a million moving parts. 
He has to be thinking about uh, the politics of it, the logistics of it, um, the deployment of forces, the deployment of resources. I mean, he's the guy who is taking the information from all of his chief commanders and making the big, tough decisions like the one I described around D-Day. Um, so as I said before, you know, there were um, always provisional plans for a lot of these operations, uh, but he had to be in agreement with what the final result was, and this required him knowing a lot about these various areas himself. So what I would say to people who are interested in the difference between what I call operational leadership and strategic leadership is what made Eisenhower a great strategic leader. First of all, he had strategic talent, um, and that is hugely helpful because I think even neuroscientists would say that it's, um, you might um, have an aptitude for it, okay? But he was made a much better strategic leader because he'd been through operational posts. Uh, he knew a lot about logistics. He knew a lot about organization. He'd been put in areas of responsibility that required that. So that he had kind of an instinctual feel, like on the Normandy plan, there's just not enough strength here. You know, uh, too many things can happen to this small unit, three beaches. I mean, we, we were, uh, let's remember that he had 24 hours to get everybody off that beach, maybe even less, depending on where the Germans were. And um, I think a, a smaller group than what was there could well have jeopardized the, the sheer firepower. Uh, I think on uh, D-Day itself, about as many, um, I think uh, the casualties were about equal between the, the uh, Germans and the Allies. So had we had a smaller force, we could have been in real trouble, or if he hadn't used the paratroopers. May I also, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to add, how many paratroopers were actually lost on the first day? Um, uh, well under 5%. Isn't that unbelievable? I mean, obviously they took big hits later on, I mean, during the whole Normandy campaign. Um, you know, there were obviously many more casualties, but the numbers weren't anything like what predicted. But see, when you get to that level, and this is part of a leadership journey, you begin to get an instinct about what works and what doesn't. These earlier campaigns like Torch um, and uh, Husky and others, you know, you make mistakes or you see what weather conditions do or you see what equipment works and what doesn't, um, how certain units operate, how certain commanders operate under stress and pressure, and you begin to get a feel for whether you've got the right elements for success? That's a great question. Thank you. Great. I think we have time for one more. Uh, I saw uh, one up here, Dan. Up oh, one up there. Right here. Um, one, one, first, I'd like to say thank you. you. You're fantastic. My God, it's so wonderful listening to you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Every time I've seen um, like a World War II movie or something like that. Um, Eisenhower had to corral an incredible group of generals to do specific things. And of course, like movies like Patton and Omar Bradley, and you, know, you know, the names that you fancy about is fantastic. How do you think he was able to get people like, and was he ever, and also, I, I, I never really knew if he was ever in charge of MacArthur, but how, I knew Patton. Nobody was. <laughs> <laughs> But how did he handle so many different types of men who were who must have had egos like crazy and was able to you know be the commander that he was? Well, it's a it's a great question since this is. Um, uh, let me answer your question first and then um, add something after that that I'd like a, a, a thought to leave you with. Um, I think how he, he did it, but I mean, again, there's some psychology involved here. And I, I think um, he knew that, you know, in order to keep a, a group of um, high-minded um, A-type personalities together, they've got to win a few, you know? In other words, you can't just dismiss their views. Um, and as I say, um, I was very moved by a comment somebody um, made to me yesterday. This is the second time I've heard this story, but Drew Middleton, who was a, um, a, a journalist and very much involved in World War II, once said to this individual, uh, the individual asked him, what do you think um, 
Eisenhower's greatest quality was or something. And he said his reasonableness. In other words, um, he didn't stake out a position and then when here and counter uh, ideas. He didn't. He didn't um, think to win. He thought to get it right. Uh, today, I think we're thinking to win, and not necessarily for getting it right. And so this is why Eisenhower can go into his presidency with what he called the middle way, because his objective was to be reasonable to everybody. If we're going to use the word reasonable, but to bring people together around the prospect that we're going to find the best path forward for everyone. And um, let's not forget that uh, Dwight Eisenhower uh, was, um, didn't even vote until just after the war. Uh, this is a man who, who uh, was pursued by both the Democrats and the Republicans because nobody knew what he was. And I'm not even sure he did particularly. Uh, I think there's some evidence that he was, uh, he certainly had an independent personality and may well have been um, uh, registered that way. In any case, um, I, I want to say the other thing is, too, that he had um, one immensely winning, I mean, he had many uh, immensely winning qualities, and I can say that. Let me tell you something. If all of you were facing me and this man came into the back room at that second exit, you would have felt him come into the room. Uh, I mean, he had wattage like crazy. And, um, and he believed because uh, somewhere along the line, I think because his mother was always sending him to what we call today time out, um, she said of her, of her six surviving boys, he had the most to learn, which is a very dignified way of saying he was troubled. Um, and, uh, but so he, somewhere along the line, he began to understand that he had this electricity and he'd have to be careful how he used it. Um, the other thing is, and I think it's because of her, but a combination of both his physical presence and his mother's <coughs> voice, is that he understood you can't get anybody to do anything if they're not feeling optimistic about the outcome. You can't get people to go into combat and actually win a battle if they think they're doomed before they go, which is why you talk to people about fly fishing. You remind them about life, and you remind them about coming home. Um, and the reason um, that's important is that we have to take away from your visit here to Gettysburg a sense of optimism, that that's what he would want you to leave with, and that's what the people who died here on these battlefields would want us to go away with, optimism about the future of this country. And if we don't start acting more optimistic and more sure we're going to make it, we won't. And that's what he would, that's what I hear in my head, that's what I heard in my head when I wrote that book. I'll just leave you with this. He, he used to tell us all the time, you've got to be for something. Be for something. Don't be against something, be for something. So on that note, I would like to thank you for this opportunity. It was <laughs>